welcome to Beware of Spoilers. I am Adam. I'm going to apologize because two episodes went up on Beware of Spoilers that were not supposed to go on Beware of Spoilers. They were both uh, 30 minute reviews episodes. But um, I buy, what's it called? Um, I, I, I buy this, this fucking anti war sign that says don't buy war toys. And I read that as I was speaking. Um, I, um, I record on my phone. And it defaults when you record to the first alphabetical, um, and I forgot to change it. Um, and then once you upload it, because the podcast is also simulcast on iHeartRadio, um, you can't change it once it's uploaded. Um, like, if it wasn't on iHeartRadio, I can just hit move, and it would move it to the right one. So, it's just got two 30-minute reviews episodes up there now um, about the CW and about, you know turning red. Um, so, let's talk about what we're going to talk about today, the tragedy of Macbeth. Uh, Joel Cohn's um, Macbeth adaptation for the screen, um, which is going to Apple TV Plus this coming Friday. But if you live in an area where they're showing it in theaters, you can see it in theaters. Um, first things first, uh, it was very obviously shot 4x3, um, so it was shot on IMAX. That was the intent, um, so it was designed to be seen in theaters, um, I don't know what the name of the performance was, but there was a, a stage performance that aired on TV, maybe only in England, um, of Oedipus Rex, um, that when we read Oedipus Rex in high school, um, or in junior high, whenever we read it, um, we watched this adaptation, I want to say it was junior high, because I think it was a I think it was my junior high teacher who was there. It, 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 irrelevant. Either way, it was an old, you know, live-action adaptation of, um, of it. And it, it, it was, you know, like, vast-looking scenes, but still had the distinct feel of being a stage performance. That's kind of what this movie feels like, where it's, you know, they do a very good job of playing with light and playing with camera angles, and, and it's like the... The way that everything is kind of designed, um, it looks like something that could be put on on a stage right now. Like, if I went to Broadway with this movie and said, can we do this? By and large, most of the stuff would have been somewhat doable. I mean, look, there's there's definitely camera angles involved, but there's a top-down view of Macbeth Macbeth and uh, Macduff fighting. Um, And look, I'm not worried about spoiling the movie. Because the the play first ran in 1611, so you've had 400 years to to uh, to read over 400 years to read this. So I'm not I have no sympathy for you. If you have not read it yet, don't get pissy with me about um, about spoilers because this it's a classic work of literature. Um, and, and it's, it, it's, you know, it, it's worth, it's worth reading, too. Um, that said, this, perf- the, this one is, you know, great things from performances from actors and from the, what the fuck was that? And from, uh, the, the way that the, uh, the set design works with the cinematography and, and everything that goes along visually with it. Um, it's a very unique experience all around. Um, I think that, um, you know, Frances McDormand makes a strong case for another Oscar nomination, making it her fourth, maybe. I mean, definitely, if she wins, it would be her, her fourth win. Cause she's got three already, but I don't think... I, I, I still think, having seen a bunch of movies that are in talks for Oscar nominations, I still think that the number one choice, for me at least, for a leading actress, um, it, it still comes down to Kristen Stewart for Spencer. Um, then probably Frances McDormand here, and then, uh, what's it called, and then finally would be, uh, what's it called, um, Lady Gaga in, uh, in House of Gucci, but it, it, it is very well done on that front, all the actors put on great performances, um, Denzel Washington is great, um, Frances McDormand is great, um, I forgot the name of the actress who plays the witches, um, she played Mrs. Fig in Harry Potter, if you need a, a frame of reference for who it is. Um, as was Brendan Gleeson, who was in Harry Potter. Um, and as was 
the guy who plays Dudley plays Brendan Gleeson's son, um, Malcolm. Um, and it's, you know, it, it is a straight adaptation. And it's not even a straight adaptation where they modernize the dialogue to make it a little bit less Shakespeare and a little bit more uh, understandable to anyone who hasn't, you know, studied Shakespeare intensively. Because that's the thing. It's like, if you've ever read Shakespeare in high school, which, if you're in the United States, it's, like, part of the curriculum. Like, you, you read, like, you know, um, like, Romeo and Juliet, um, probably Hamlet, um, maybe not anymore, but Othello used to be thrown around in there, um, because, uh, I think that's where Shylock, uh, that, that whole motif got its start. Um, there's a few... There's a little anti-Semitism that runs a nice little current through Shakespeare's work. Um, so, like, all of these, you know, classics, quote-unquote, um, well, I mean, not quote-unquote, they are classics at this point, but the th there's a larger discussion to be had about what gets considered to be a classic <clears throat> and what doesn't, and what does that do for the way we view the world. I think that's a, a broader conversation that could be had. Um, like, who decides on this? What goes into it? And then what do these classics uphold is, is a different story, but that's not what we're here to talk about. Um, so if you, if, if, if you want to see it, and the thing is, too, it's like when you read it, if you don't have a translation guide with you from, like, what does all the symbolism mean and what he's saying, like, what does all this mean, then it's going to make you be like, oh, that's, you know, annoying. And the thing is, too, it's not symbolism, which is what a lot of English people say. They'll say, oh, it's symbolism. But it's, it's symbolism in the same way an idiomatic expression that we know today would be symbolism. Like, if we say curiosity killed the cat, it's not symbolism, it's an idiomatic expression. And I think that that's something that is two different things, where it's like, people in the in the 16th century weren't literate to the degree where they're like, oh, and I understand all of this symbolism that's always happening. It's like, no, it's, it, 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 there are idiomatic expressions that were common for the time, but have fallen out of favor since. Um, and it's the way people talked and the way that English evolves as a language. That's the thing, language evolves and language changes. But if you aren't familiar with 17th century, you know, English, then it could be a little rough for you. Um, what else was there with this? Um, but the thing is, because it's visually, you know, shown, some of the more confusing aspects are easier to, um, what's it called? They're easier to understand. Because you have a visual aid going along with it, whereas if you were just reading it, it's kind of like, oh, well, you know, it, 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 like I gotta try and piece this together in a way that I don't have to there. So it, it makes it a little bit easier, but there still is a little bit of a, a barrier to entry, is what I would call it, where it's like you, you should have some understanding, because like broadly you'll figure out what's going on. It's not, it's not rocket science to, science to figure out what's going on. It's like, guy gets a prophecy that he's gonna become king, um, and he's become the Thane of whatever the fuck the name of the place was. Um, he goes, he becomes the Thane of there, and he's like, oh wait, I am gonna become king. So he starts trying to actively work out what he can do to get, um, to, to get to where that prophecy is he wants that. And then what can he do to keep from losing that power? And it's a story about, you know, the dangers of very high aspirations and, and, all, and all of that. And it's, it, it, what the fuck is with people in Tesla's um, using, you know, custom license plates, and it's always something really stupid, um, anyway, um, but because it's all of that, um, it, it's not necessarily something that is particularly, you know, tough to understand if you're watching it, it's like, it, it, it's all pretty clear what's going on, and, and there, even if you don't understand 100% of what's happening, you can kind of piece together what's happening. In a weird way, it's kind of like watching a foreign film where it, it, without subtitles, though. Because, like, if you watch, like, Parasite without subtitles, you can still figure out what's going on if you don't speak Korean. If you, if you watch, you know, an anime, um, you can still somewhat figure out what's going on if you don't watch it with subtitles. Um, you can still figure, especially if you watch the dub, but... Um, there are still things that are, like, if you, you can watch Squid Game and understand what's going on without subtitles, you won't get nuance, but you'll get the, the, the full, you'll, you'll get the, the gist of the story. And it's kind of that same thing here. Um, what else was there that I wanted to address with this? Um, very worth your time to watch. Um, oh, the way they do the witches is great. Um, because in the book, or the play, 
you'll recall there are three witches. It's where a lot of, um, what's it called? A lot of, um, language that we use even today comes from. Something, something wicked this way comes, comes from Macbeth. Bubble, bubble, toil and trouble comes from Macbeth. And, and all of this stuff comes from Macbeth and, and, you know, it's, it's the portrayal of the witches. And the way they do it here is, again, it's the actress who plays Mrs. Fig, who up until today didn't know was a contortionist. Um, she does that to create this kind of un- inhuman look about her in the same way that, like, I, I, it's not at all the same thing. And I completely understand that it's not at all the same thing, but it kind of is. If you watch the, the ragdoll episode of The Flash, um, the way that they, they have a contortionist and then a voice actor who does it, because the contortionist is not an actor, but he just does the contortioning, and it creates this look like, oh, the human body shouldn't do that. That's fucked up. And it's that same kind of thing where it's like it creates this kind of unsettling, eerie after effect um, from her doing this. They're like, oh, that's not normal. That should not be able to happen. That is bizarre on every level. And then it's like, um, okay, well, cool. Um, like, and, and then with that, it's like they use camera effects too for, for some of it. Where it's like, on two separate occasions, she has big scenes, because she has two prophecies in the play. The first is the prophecy that she, that she gives to, to Macbeth and Banquo, and then the, the later one she gives to Macbeth about his death. Um, and in the, in the first one, we see her standing in front of a puddle, and it's just her. And then in the puddle, there are two reflections of her on either side of where she's standing. So that's how you get the three sisters. And then the... The second time, it's she's crouched in the rafters because she's meant to be like a crow or a raven. I don't remember what the exact bird was. And truth be told, AMC royally fucked up the screening. And for whatever reason, every bit of sound was going through properly, um, except for the dialogue. Um, And the dialogue was going in. It sounded like it was being played from the next theater and then pumped through the wall. And it's like, oh, okay, I can kind of hear it, but not really. Which made it a little bit more annoying to understand. But that was AMC's fault, not the movie's fault. Um, and then AMC seemed very reluctant to do anything about that, annoyingly enough. So, um, all of that's happening. And then um, I, I, I watched the... So, so we see her up, up there looking down um, as this. And then when we see her close up, we see her face and, and she's talking like normal, but she's still crouched in the rafters. When it zooms out and you see a wide shot of the three sisters, which really there's only one, but when you see that wide shot, um, her hood is down over her face and and she's looking down. Um, so it looks like these three massive, like bird human hybrid things are up in the rafters and it's just so unsettling, but it works so well. Um, I think that this, this is a, a great movie all around. Um, There was one other thing I wanted to address with this. Um, I don't remember what it was, though. Um, um, And if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, that's what it was. If you're a Lord of the Rings fan, you will definitely uh, get a kick out of this. Because two things from Lord of the Rings get their origins in this play. And you can see them writ large on the big screen. Um, the, The idea that... Um, they, uh, the, the whole, you know, killed by no man born of woman comes from Macbeth. That was the, the prophecy that mm-hmm. is given. Now, in Macbeth, it is, it, it's a little dubious because it's like, well, yeah, I wasn't born of a woman. I was born via C-section. It's like, okay, yeah, but, you know, you, you were still carried to, to turn. Like, you were still carried in, in a woman. Like, yeah, you didn't get born naturally, but... You were, you were still, you were still born. Like, it, it is, at best, dubious, at worst, uh, like, silly. Um, and then it's, it's that kind of thing where it's like, Tolkien read that and he was like, oh no, we'll just make it, it, it couldn't it be a woman who did it? Because the prophecy is no man born of woman uh, will be able to do it. So, if it's not a man, if it, it, it could be a woman, and that would have worked. Um, and then the other thing was, um, the forest coming to, um, like, when the forest comes, that will be your end, and that, that 
comes from, like, the Ents in Lord of the Rings come from that, too, because he was like, oh, are they actually going to come in the forest? It's like, no. It's a bunch of people, like, with trees, like, like holding branches up, and he's like, oh, that's fucking stupid. Um, and then that's where that comes from, is the trees come to help in, in, uh, in uh, the two towers. Um, but yeah, so a lot of cool things happen in this movie. Um, so we'll wrap up there for today. Um, been a bit, bit of a busy weekend, not at all exa- like exacerbated by the fact that there was a fucking snowstorm too. Um, but uh, next week we have, um, what do we have next week? Uh, Peacemaker. We're going to do Naomi a little more in depth now that, you know, Naomi is coming out on Tuesday. And I can actually talk about Naomi without worrying about violating an NDA um, or violating a, 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 a DNR, I think it's called, Do Not Reveal. Um, but I can, I can, you know, I can talk about it and not worry about spoiling anything from the first episode. Um, so that'll be cool. Um, and then... Uh, that's this week as well. Uh, Peacemaker this week. Book of Boat Fat episode three. Um, and then there's also, I'm going to see the 355. Probably going to see that next weekend. Um, Bell and Scream. Um, I'm not looking forward to Scream. Partially because I don't like horror movies. Um, I would say, you know, more because I don't like the Scream movies. Um, I think as a franchise, Scream is overrated, so I'm not 100% thrilled about a fifth one. And it's like, look, and these people are back. See, now you care, right? Here's Neff Campbell, and here, and here's Courtney Cox. You haven't seen her in 10 minutes. Like, here, look, it's gonna be fun. Watch it. And I'm like, okay, I guess. Like, it also has something to do with the fact that I don't have nostalgia for it because I saw it like six months ago for the first time, and I was like, cool, I guess. Like. It's a parody. It, like it, it's basically a parody of horror movies. So I don't like. I don't have the the attention to like what's it called? The, not the attention to, but like the uh, like the uh, the uh, um, the attachment to it that maybe someone else might have to this movie. But you know, they they're, they're not just making it for nostalgia. They're making it for everyone. So if it doesn't work. If the nostalgia works, the nostalgia works. But if the movie as a whole doesn't work, then what's the point? In the same way that, like, No Way Home doesn't work if the base movie doesn't work. Like, you can have the Spider-Man show up, but if the movie we're watching leading up to the Spider-Man showing up is not good, then who cares about the Spider-Man showing up? Um, in the same way that, like, look, I mean, look at the Force Away, look at the Star Wars sequel trilogy, and that's how you'll see. It's like, you know, the, the movie's... Um, like, people did not like The Rise of Sky... Well, I didn't like The Rise of Skywalker, but there's a lot of nostalgia there. And it's like, well, here's Wedge, and here's Lando, and I'm like, cool, awesome that you got all that back, but, like, at the same time, you're not really giving me enough to care about in the base story to make me care about this. Um, and when you look at, like, um, what was the other one? Um, fuck, what was the other one called? Uh, like, uh, oh, The Last Jedi. A lot of people hated, and, and there was Luke Skywalker, front and center of this movie. And he was, you know, the be-all and end-all of this movie. Yet, it was not enough to get people to like the movie. And I think we're gonna, you may run into the same thing here with Scream. Where it's like, oh, and here's Sydney again, and here's, you know, all of this stuff. And it's like, I don't give a fuck. Um, but the base movie doesn't work, then the movie doesn't work. I mean, we'll, we'll see on Friday. Um, Bell, um, for those of you who don't know, is a Japanese animated movie. Um, about uh, a girl who takes on an alter ego in a virtual world. Um, it is getting a lot of buzz for best animated feature this year. That's why I made my list. So I will be seeing uh, Bell this coming uh, Wednesday um, in advance of its full theatrical on Friday. Um, and yeah, um, I think that really it. Um, I mentioned Peacemaker. Peacemaker happens when it happens. Um, but yeah, so we'll wrap up there for today. Um, if, if you don't want to go brave going to see it, going to the movie to see, uh, The Tragedy of Macbeth, you can go and see it, um, on Apple TV Plus this coming Friday. It'll be available, um, completely for free. You won't have to pay, you know, anything extra. 
Um, it's just included in your Apple subscription, and I don't think there's anyone on the planet who actually pays for Apple TV+. Plus. Um, I think it's just, uh, you know, you buy an Apple product and they give it to you for free for a year, and then you watch it when, whenever something comes out that's worth watching. And, and they've had some cool things. Um, the, the What's It Called was pretty cool. The uh, uh, Swan Song was pretty cool. Um, Coda was really good. Um, and now this. So they, they really are putting out good content on Apple TV+. Plus. So definitely, definitely, definitely worth your time to watch. Um, but yeah, we'll wrap up there for today. And we'll be back um, on... Uh, uh, when's the next episode going to be? Uh, probably Wednesday. Yeah, probably Wednesday. Uh, or, yeah, Wednesday morning for Nate. No. I don't know. I, uh, probably Wednesday. Um, but until then, have a great rest of your week.